but I really appreciate that you asked a question and uh, it's clearly based on the last lecture that we discussed. We should have you framed such a class. So continue. So pulmonary ventilation, we start today. I'll, I'll shorten the lecture so that the rest of the gang can join us tomorrow. So we will today just talk about the mechanical aspects of ventilation, i.e. the muscles involved uh, in ventilation. Uh, how do they, what, what, what are they? And number two, physically speaking, how can the lung, how can the chest cage and the lung uh, secondary to it expand under which dimensions, okay? So we will be looking at actually all three of them. It's not a very long thing anyway. So meet the muscles of respiration. It's a very simple thing. You don't have to do a lot of cram uh, cramming like you have to do for your stage. Very simple actually. If you just follow the direction, start with here. So there are muscles of inspiration, muscles that when they contract, the ins inspiration sequence is triggered. And I've been hinting this all along that you don't suck air in. You don't do that normally. Normally air just enters your lungs effortlessly. You don't, you're not even aware of it. How does that happen? It happens because certain muscles of inspiration, they contract. And when they contract, a sequence of events is triggered, which allows the air to seamlessly enter the lungs. muscles Which muscles are there? So the main muscle is the diaphragm, that dome-shaped muscle. You know this. So it contracts and it's the main muscle of inspiration. Please remember that. Usually vivas of respiration start with this question. But uh, tell us the muscles of respiration. And here, now you now this is the place to shine. You start with the muscles of inspiration. Then you enumerate those muscles of inspiration, which is just one. Then you say accessory muscles of inspiration. Those muscles which are brought on by effort. So right now, it's just the diaphragm. No, 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 no complications. However, when you strain, so for example, when you exercise, you need an extra kick. You need extra air to enter the lungs because your oxygen requirement of the tissues have increased. So you need more volume of air to, uh, 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 to come inside, right? So simple diaphragm movement and whatever it does with the lung is not enough in this situation. So you have accessory muscles. It's the accessory muscles of inspiration, contract only during forceful inspiration. Everything is written. Sternocleidomastoid and sclenus, sclenus muscles. They tuck the, the lung upwards or sternocleidomastoid is that big muscle which is So these are the accessory muscles of inspiration not brought on, not required at rest. So going back to the viva, the viva starts with what are the muscles of respiration? The examiner has given you a, a, a big question. The way you break it down gives the examiner that the guy is organized. You can be a nightmare in your real life. Doesn't matter. But the way you answer, at least at that time, the drama that you put on is very important. So you say, Respiration involves inspiration and expiration. The examiner immediately thinks, ah, this is a good one here. Then you say, inspiration is further divided into two. Normal, at rest inspiration. For that, we have the diaphragm. And then exercise and accessory muscles, etc., etc. There are two, one and two. Done. Now let's look at the expiration. In expiration, you will only see one heading. Active expiration. Did the diagram miss at rest expiration? Clearly, it's missing. This information is missing from this diagram. Is it? At rest expiration is a dash process. Active process or passive process? Passive, passive process. How does it do? How, how does it come about? Diaphragm ka elastic recoil. It's passive. You contracted the diaphragm during inspiration. Obviously, it has to go back to rest. It's going back to rest also is involved in respiration. How? It actually expires the lungs. However, again, in exercise scenarios or straining scenarios, you need the extra, extra kick. 
So all of these muscles, abdominal muscles and internal intercostal muscles, they come into play when you're straining, when you're pushing in expiration, when you want to get extra air out. Okay? Remember this. Questions to Ajneyum. Okay. Very long slide. Forget about this. Just listen. There are two ways you can expand the chest cage. Everyone has a chest cage. Just imagine which two areas, basically cover here, which two dimensions can the chest cage expand? In? The anterior posterior. So if I stand like this, this, the chest movement along this plane, okay? And then there is the vertical thing, obviously diaphragm, body bar, okay? The vertical thing. In anterior posterior, you should also add a anterior, anterior posterior and some lateral elements. So laterally also it can expand. So the chest cage is one round thing, right? So it can be lengthened or shortened along the vertical axis, the anterior posterior axis, axis and the lateral axis. We've covered all areas, yes? So this is what's written. Now these are the two things, pump handle and bucket handle, not given in guide and probably in the latest, latest editions that he has mentioned them. But it's a very pet question of examiners, especially old ones in virus. What is pump handle movement? What is bucket handle movement? It's very easy, as you'll see. These are the, they have given, uh, again, routine life examples uh, to, 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 to give you a picture of how the chest cage expands. So you have seen this. Many of you might not have seen it. It's called a pump handle. Okay, it's it's a manual way they bring out water in villages. They still do. Okay, uh, they they pull it up. It creates a vacuum inside the the big bore that goes into the earth, and then they when they push, water comes out. It's a wonderful device. I've actually used it once in my life. Uh, we were visiting a village. What has this got to do with the chest cage? Well, it does. So check this out. This, you know, sternum? Sternum is, is this bone right here, okay? This is the sternum, this hard thing here, right? And then there are ribs that are coming out of the sternum and going to the back on the, connecting the, uh, on the vertebral column, okay? And they're usually, the, the ribs are like, not like this, like not horizontal, they are a bit depressed. So they're horizontal, but down at a down angle. So they're like this, not like this. They are in a slant like this. So if you were to physically hand, uh, take your sternum in your hand and pull it out and push it in, pull it out, push it in. This is similar to what a pump handle does. You pull the handle, and you push it down. It's very simple. It's not rocket science. Uh, the reason I'm explaining this is because you most probably will be asked in a viva. Maybe not in written, uh, but in viva, definitely they will ask. If the viva is on the first chapter, definitely they'll go into this business. Okay. So it is like a pump handle and it increases which diameter when you pull the sternum out. Sternum is being pulled out. Which diameter is this? Anterior posterior diameter. Very simple, nothing fancy. And when you push it back, anterior posterior diameter is decreased. When you pull it out, anterior posterior diameter is increased. Okay. So the lung, uh, the chest wall, and and the lung, which is attached to it, is pulled in the anterior posterior aspect by this type of move. That's it. Sawal hai, question hai. It's pretty self-explanatory. And the bucket handle is even simpler. Literally, a bucket, you must have seen a bucket. Okay, and the handle of the bucket. When it's at rest, it, it is, it is here. Okay. When you pull it up and bring it to the brim, it becomes this. This is likened, this is like the ribs. So the ribs I told you are at an angle and they are, they're horizontal, but in a, in a downward sloping manner. When, if, what if you pull them up like this? So if you're not inspiring, 
your ribs go down like this on on top of the lungs when you inspire they go up this is this angle it's like a bucket handle okay as if your life wasn't difficult enough to remember semantics but this is what bucket handle movement is okay movement of the ribs along the lateral diameters increasing the lateral diameter which by the way you can include in the anterior posterior which is because lateral is not a huge thing however the viva question is there and side i'm covering it okay so this is the as you can see there are three pictures to clarify that the ribs go in in this direction okay questions well this you have to solve read it and tell me the fill in the blanks this is one fill in the blank two three four and this is the consequence so it's very simple to read it it's a good revision medullary respiratory centers are brain respiratory centers philhar itna hi kar phrenic nerve is a nerve which connects the centers to the diaphragm the rest is obvious should be obvious so the answer to question 3 is diaphragm and external intercostals are activated they're stimulated yes done four thoracic volume increases five lung volume also increases alveolar pressure decreases this is that first phase of inspiration good and air flows into the alveolar the reason i seemingly this is very childish sort of uh, exercise but it actually does one thing for me it reinforces what i have been saying from the second lecture onwards that air movement at rest is effortless because of the workings of a muscle and the movement of the chest the movement of the air is secondary to these two things so a muscle was contracted diaphragm in this case it went down it increased the internal volume of the it made a um, a vacuum or more it it basically created more volume inside the lung to fill that volume air from the atmosphere just flowed in this is something that i have been repeating because today you can easily solve this this is the reverse of what we have done just now everything is reversed but do look at the sequence remember there is a medullary center in the medulla medullary as in in the medulla of the brain there is a respiratory center so now you know that there is something here which controls respiration okay so you know that uh, and diaphragm and diaphragm is the main hero of the respiratory cycle at rest so all you need to do is contract the diaphragm during inspiration and nothing else it will recoil after a few seconds and expiration will happen passively okay questions who controls the medullary respiratory center oh the anatomy island has an answer go on that's a pretty neat answer pretty neat answer but it affects the respiratory center yes does the respiratory center what's 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 super cool about the respiratory center let me put it that way it's involuntary who said that you very good name one more tissue which is as cool as the respiratory center cardiac cardiac name specific specific which part of the heart has the same coolness as the respiratory center sino s a no the pace maker of the heart both of these tissues they are automatic they are brought into service at birth and when they stop we stop and they are automatic you don't do this you don't stimulate them imagine if you had to stimulate your heart for it to beat what would happen to life or imagine if somehow you have to stimulate your medullary center to breathe there is a there is a syndrome called ondine's curse maybe this will uh, get the anatomy gang uh, 
interested in what we are doing. On Dyn's curse. So I'll just I'll just give you the quick interesting bits in it. It has a mermaid who falls in love with the prince. That's it. That's all the information I'll give you today. But it is linked with an actual medical disorder in which the involuntary bit of the respiratory center goes. And this person is totally on his cerebral cortex, the conscious center to stimulate the respiratory center. So guess what he, this chap bichara can't do. He can't sleep. As soon as he sleeps, the cerebral cortex goes off. He wakes up again and consciously then again triggers the medullary center and starts to breathe. So it's a curse. Ondine's curse. Ondine probably was the name of the mermaid. Where is that mermaid coming from? I'm just, I'm just throwing this away uh, for people who are not interested in reading anatomy. And I'll, I'll secretly tell the physiology gang later on. Okay. Okay. We have, well, you've done. We're done. So with a brief explanation of compliance, I'll let you go. Remember, okay, this is important. And I, I think this is casual stuff. So you guys can probably later see it on the video. This is a chart that I, uh, last year, uh, last year I pulled it off from the WHO site, WHO, World Health Organization. Okay. This is their real data. Check this out. This is the year 2000. Can you see this? This is the year 2005, 10, and 16. So maybe there is a current version as well. They do it after every five, six years, right? These are the top causes of death, as the name says. And check out the top one, ischemic heart disease. Number two, stroke. Stroke is cerebrovascular accident. Uh, foliage ka tag score, you may get them. Check the third one out. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. So COPD is not these fellows are rock stars for you. They have COPD. You need to read this up very, very closely. That's why I started you guys early. Okay. So COPD is the number third. And look, this is consistent. It's consistent across from 2000 to 2016. I'm sure pretty much that this is the case today as well. If Allah forbid, it may have gone up actually. Okay. So number one is IHD, ischemic heart disease. Number two is stroke. Number three is respiration. Check the fourth one out. Lower respiratory infections. Then check the sixth one out. Tuberculosis. Seven, cancers, lung cancers. All of these relate to respiratory system. And we don't even have COVID here. COVID obviously started in 2019. So the, uh, the updated list will be, will give you more data and please, as I say, read the newspaper, uh, go to WHO sites once in a while, every like couple of months, just toggle around, look here and there for information of what's going on in the world, then narrow it down to Asia, then narrow it down to the subcontinent, and of course, then the country. You will have a, you will have a picture of what you're studying. Okay, COPD has actually a whole page on the WHO site, might want to visit that as well. Facebook that is such a nice thing you just waste it okay I, I want you to remember gold you would remember gold anyway but there's a gold criteria it obviously stands for something global uh, obstructive lung diseases it's a standard it's a criteria gold gold criteria they grade COPD into four categories based on this criteria. Now, what they do is they give you, they give the person a bronchodilator because the guy cannot breathe or, or he has or she has problems with breathing. And you know some of that. What is the main thing this guy has problems with? Inspiration or expiration? Expiration. The guy has problems with expiration. Remember the lung and all that stuff. Now, they give this person a bronchodilator inhaler. Okay, and that is supposed to dilate the airways. So symptoms should improve, right? Now, the degree 
to which the symptoms improve we can calculate that and classify our our patient along the four categories so if the the the, the symptoms really improve then he is gold one okay if they are less than 80 but more than 50 if he is in between 50 and 80 then it's gold 2 gold 3 is severe gold 4 is very severe is less than even 30% i.e after the medicine still he did not improve and his improvement was less than 30 imagine what his daily life would be is almost almost sort of dying this person so gold criteria i want you to remember you are you were told about the gold criteria today in your what fourth lecture of respiration so some of you who may end up in inshallah specializing in this field you will be dealing with gold a lot that gold yes but first we have to do this one okay people are smiling 